So it looks like you guys enjoyed my DJI OM4 review. So I've decided to go next level and today I'm gonna tell you about this. DJI RavenEye. It's an image transmitting device that can talk to your camera, your gimbal and the phone. And in this video, I will show you how well it works with the Sony a7 III and DJI RSC2. It's Alex here, welcome to the Geek Stable, and let's start the review. Short disclaimer, this video is sponsored by myself, so all the devices are mine. Also, I welcome you to the comments in case you have any thoughts or questions. I do check them out, and if I can, I will be glad to help you. Okay, so why would we need this device here? So the obvious thing is the auto tracking. So for example, you wish to walk around some object and you want that object to be always in the frame. And we actually could do that before. So this is the Ronin SC, the first generation, and I've placed the a7 III on it with the 24 5 millimeter lens. And on top of the camera, I have a smartphone with a DJI app. So I could enable the tracking on the phone and it would tell the gimbal how to move and it would work but it has some disadvantages. So first of all, the whole construction is very heavy and it's really hard to balance. And even when you do balance it, it's really easy to break the balance. So for example, I will just go down or up. Let's go down, see? So the balance is ruined and now it will automatically shut down. You're also losing the ability to trigger the record button on a distance because your phone is attached to your gimbal and to your camera and it's not in your hand anymore. And also the phone uses its own camera for tracking. So in case I would zoom to like 90 millimeters as it's right now, the picture on the phone's camera will be nothing in common with the main camera. And here the Raven Eye comes on stage to solve these problems. So let's have a closer look at it. It has a USB-C on the front, a mini HDMI and another USB-C on the back, a power button with a battery indicator on the side, and on the bottom, it has a handy holder that goes to the camera's hot shoe or to the bottom of the RSC2. Okay, so let's set up the construction. First of all, we will use the USB-C to USB-C cable. It will connect the front of the Raven Eye and the third USB-C port of the gimbal. Next one, we'll use the USB-C to Sony's multi-port cable. So for those of you who don't know, the Sony's multi-port cable looks exactly as the micro USB cable, but with a longer nose. And keep in mind that normal micro USB cables won't work. So the USB-C part will go to the first USB-C in the row of the gimbal, and the multi-port will obviously go to the camera. And the final step is the HDMI. So we'll connect it to the Raven Eye and to the camera. RSC2 is turned on now and it's connected to my tablet. But instead of a tablet, you can use your phone, obviously. And we're turning on the Raven Eye. Okay. Now what we have to do, we have to go to the Wi-Fi settings where the network provided by the Raven Eye should arrive in a few minutes, or I would say seconds. Okay, here it is. Okay, we've connected to the Raven Eye and we are coming back to the Ronin app and automatically it switches to the viewfinder of the camera. So it's exactly the image from the camera's viewfinder. I can wave here and I see the result right away. Now let's go through the app and see what we've gained by connecting the Raven Eye. So first of all, we have in the top right corner, the Raven Eye settings. There are quite a lot of them. Let's go through them real quick. So first of all is the guide frame. It shows you the guide frame overlay of the image. You can turn it off obviously, or you can have the golden ratio. I usually have the rule of thirds. Next one is the aspect marker. So in case you're delivering and something aside from 16 by nine, and the frame will be adjusted to that aspect ratio. So for example, if you're delivering for TikTok or Instagram, you, you need your image to be vertical. It's good to have it. I don't do that, so I usually turn it off. Now let's go next is the safety zone marker. So for example, if you need a safe frame around your image, in case you're going to add something there or to be able to crop it later, you can select it here. So it will show you like dotted line around your image. I don't need that, but it's good to have it. 
Next one is the focus picking threshold. I will skip it for now. It's an interesting one. We will dedicate some extra time later. Next one is the center marker. You are able to add a center point or diagonals or both of them. Let's keep the center point, for example. And then in case you are shooting something white, like let's switch here. So we have a white wall there. So we might want to switch the color of the marker to anything available. Okay, if we want it to be bolder, we can select the bolder width. We have three options. To me, the smallest one is fine. And finally, we reached a very interesting setting, which I really like RavenEye for, is the shutter option. So what do we have here? We actually are able to record a proxy video on our iPad or iPhone or Android, any device that is connected to the RavenEye, straight from the app. And that is pretty simple. So the camera gives us the video stream through the HDMI to the RavenEye and RavenEye transmits the video stream to your device. So since we already have this video stream, why not to be able to save it as a video file? So we have three options here. We can shoot, it will be recorded only on the camera. We can cache, so it will be only a proxy video on your device. We can do shoot and cache, so it will be doing both things at a time. And we can limit our memory in case we don't want to, you know, occupy all the memory of the device. I usually don't set the limit. So the proxy files are shot in Full HD and in Rec. 709, so they're not good for grading. But there is one thing. Have you ever had this moment when you went to a shooting and you realized that you forgot a memory card? Or you just occupied all the memory cards and you were just in the middle of the shooting day? Hit a like if you had such a case. And in this case, you will still be able to shoot a video from the camera to your device. See, there is no card blinking, so the camera won't be able to shoot anything on itself, but we still have an option to record it here. So if I click, I will see that the camera cannot shoot, obviously, but we are still recording a proxy. So we won't have a 4K video or something that is good for grading, but some video is better than no video. So once we're done shooting, we can go to the bottom right corner. There is the gallery here. And there will be your recordings, which you can save to the Photos app. I wish they were be able to share it to any app, like the Files app, that would be much quicker to upload it to an external server. But we have only this option, so you could download it just to the Photos app. Also, because this gallery can be accessed only through the viewfinder, that's a bit weird thing to do, you're able to get your videos only while the RavenEye is connected. Once you lose the connection, you will lose an access to all this UI, including the gallery. So in case you're planning to give the RavenEye to someone else, be sure that you copied all the proxy videos first. On the bottom, we have the camera settings, which normally we would be able to change from a distance. But unfortunately, this is the only thing that doesn't work on A7 III. Because for this functionality, we need to use this USB-C port and we will should be able to connect it to the RavenEye. But when we will connect it, we will lose the image transmission due to some internal limitations. So if you want to keep the image transmission and the tracking option, you have to set up your camera while you are near the camera and leave this USB-C port unused. Moving on, and on the left, there are two buttons to operate with a gimbal. Could be useful if you're quite far away from the camera. So one of them is to recenter the gimbal and the other one is to provide you the force mobile option or a virtual joystick. I don't know anyone who would use the force mobile and who would enjoy using it. So if you don't know, this is an option to use the gyroscope of your device to control the gimbal. But usually it looks a bit weird. So I prefer to use just the virtual joystick and you are able to operate with your gimbal and also to do some tilting, but let's recenter it. Okay, so now I'm quite far from the gimbal in the other room, so I have two walls separation and let's see if the bandwidth is enough to control the gimbal from such a distance. So let's try. Yeah, and it works and I don't see actually any delays. So whenever I drag, for example, to the right, 
it goes to the right. So if you wish to capture your pets or kids secretly, that could be it. The button in the bottom left corner is called Raven Eye Assistant. You may turn it off or on in the settings. And this is where the Raven Eye shines because it adds some handy overlays over the video stream. So let's go through them. First one is the zebras and it will show you overexposed places with the zebras. I guess you know what, what that means. Keep in mind though that they won't be the same as the zebras on the camera because you can customize the zebras on the camera and here you cannot. So if I, for example, will increase the ISO, let's see. So yeah, on the camera, we don't see the right place as uh, overexposed, but we already have it covered with zebras on the Raven Eye. Next one, we can turn on the full color. So it will cover in red the overexposed parts of the image. And if we go down with the ISO, it'll cover with blue the underexposed parts of the image. Okay, so next one is the focus peaking. And it's handy in case of the a7 III, which has focus peaking, but only for the photos or in videos where you have the manual focus turned on. But in case you are using the autofocus and you just want to know which the part of the image is in focus, you might use this overlay through the Raven Eye. So it helps you to understand which part of the frame is in focus right now and which is not. And that setting that we skipped before, the focus peaking, it controls the highlighting. I usually have it set it up to 30, but you can decrease the number and the more places of the image will be treated as in focus, or you can increase the number and the less places of the image will be treated as in focus. For me, 30 is the optimal number. I've compared the accuracy with my Sony a7C, which has focus peaking for videos, and the result was pretty similar. So I would say that you can rely on what Raven Eye says. In case you're shooting log or HLG or any other picture profile, you probably use the Sony's Gamma Display Assistant. For those of you who don't know, so for example, you're using S-Log and the image by default is undersaturated and can be washed out. And for be able to understand what's going on in the frame, we just go to the menu, to the setup, and here to the Gamma Display Assist and turn it to Auto, for example, or to S-Log2 or to any other picture profile that you use. I personally use Auto, so it gets switched to from S-Log2 to HLG automatically. And suddenly the image becomes brighter and more saturated, so it's not the actual image that will be recorded to your camera, but at least it helps you to understand what's going on in, the, in your frame. And now we're able to have the same option on the Raven Eye. So if we click this fourth button, which says LUT, we can add a custom LUT or to use one of those that are provided. So if we turn on, we see that the image became more saturated and more highlighted. So now it's easier to understand what's going on. And finally, there is a channel switcher. Here it is which can switch the channels from red to green to blue to grayscale and back to RGB. And it's handy to use with zebras because you can have the situation when, for example, red and green channels are exposed normally, but the blue one is just washed out. And you probably won't be able to notice it with just using zebras on RGB. So you can just switch through the channels and see that, okay, we don't have any overexposed places and we are good to go. Keep in mind that none of these overlays, including LUTs, will be applied to the proxy image. So it will be saved as is, as the camera provided it. So unfortunately, no grading on the fly. And now let's check the tracking finally. It's done pretty simple here. If you wish to track an object, you just select it and it will be followed. So I've decided to walk a little bit to see if the speed is enough to be tracked. And then I decided to have a short run. And also I've tried to hide behind the trees and see if the raven eye would understand where I will reappear. You can obviously change the tracking speed and adjust it depending on your needs and the lens that you're using. For better results, DJI recommends to set it as 20 for a 24 mm lens and you should increase it in case of a smaller focal length. 
and decrease it in case of a bigger focal length. So, should you buy this device for your camera? If you rely on tracking a lot, then I'm sure that you've already ordered one. And also you should get it if you don't have any person behind the camera and you wish to shoot either yourself or yourself with your family. But if you rarely use those features and wish to shoot yourself in a static frame like this, just buy a Bluetooth or infrared remote. That will be enough for you and will be somewhat cheaper than the RavenEye. I hope this review was useful for you. Write a comment in case you have any thoughts or questions. I'd be glad to check them out. It's been Alex and see you at the Geeks Table. Bye-bye.